All right. So, Jenny, will you get the door for us? All right, listen. I, whatever I get through today, whatever I get through today is what is going to be my notes that I go over from the Civil War timeline. We still will talk a little bit about the AUS questions today and B, and B, you are engaged and get this stuff. So here's what I propose. I need you to save. Um, if I have paper, uh, half of a paper. And then what I would do is below these notes, I write down number one, which is Fort Sumter. <laughs> Known as the Battle of Manassas. Do you mean we don't kill him? You can. You write a little bit bigger. You could do that. You won't need more than three lines of space. But what I want to do is we're going to place these events on the timeline so you can see them happening, and then I'm going to talk about them so you can add in some detailed information. I don't need you to know the exact dates of these. But I do need you to know chronology. I need you to know that Bull Run is the first major battle. And I need you to know about why Antietam is so important. And I need you to know where the Emancipation Proclamation fits into all this. So, again, the, the events are going to be Fort Sumter, First Bull Run, or Manassas. By the way, the reason it's in parentheses is that the North and the South commonly named battles two different names. Did you, does anyone know why they did this? Well, that's part of it. Is they don't like to agree on things. Um, I, got, I always get this mixed up, but i got to make sure I don't. So the North would name battles for geogra the nearest geographic location or indicator. So I think, I think that's right. So Bull Run is the creek that runs by where the battle was fought. Uh, the South would name them for the nearest city or town. So Manassas Junction is where the railroad ran through the town there closest by. So that's why you get the nearest, um, that's why you get the two different names. I think I said that right. Uh, this is the Peninsula Campaign, P-E-N-I-N-S-U-L-A, Peninsula Campaign. The Second Battle of Bull Run, or Second Manassas, and Tenum. The Emancipation Proclamation, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Vicksburg, the Gettysburg Address, Sherman's March to the Sea, Appomattox Courthouse, two P's, two T's, Appomattox Courthouse, and Lincoln's Assassination. There are other events. There are way more battles. Uh, I mean, that's, that's just a small sample, but these are major things that I want you to be familiar with and, and to know. Any questions about that? Go ahead and get that copy down. And then what I would do is on a total or side, I don't really care, but I would talk. So as we put events on the timeline, then you can flip back to the this page of notes here, and you could fill in in the Remember uh, two days ago or three days ago when I started doing the snapshot of the Civil War? I just want to add a couple more things to that. So it's like a continuation of the snapshot. Um, several things about the strategy of the North and the South. About, um, the wars of both the North and Then also I want to do some stuff about how the war impacted women and how Lincoln also exercised um, a lot of power as the, as the president and kind of expanded the executive power throughout the war. Yeah? What is the after Emancipation Um Oh, Chancellorsville. C-H-A-N-E-L-L-C-H-A-N-C-E-L-L-O-R-S-V-I-L-L-E. -L 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 -E. Yes. Appomattox. A-P-P-O-M-A-T-T-O-X. Appomattox Courthouse. 
Um, there's actually a really interesting story that I can kind of tell you while you're copying this down. The first major battle of the Civil War is going to be at First Bull Run. Uh, the person who owned that property where that first battle took place got word that the Union and Confederate troops were converging on his property, and he was worried and wound up packing up his stuff and moving uh, to get away from the Civil War. And he moved, he moved uh, I don't know if it's further out into the country, but he moved elsewhere to avoid the conflict. Um, and for the most part, he did avoid the conflict of the Civil War, except for the fact that the very last thing that happened at the Civil War was the ceasefire, the truce that was signed in which General Lee surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. That was the name of this guy's plantation. This is where he moved to. And so the guy who owned the property where the first battle happened had the Civil War end in the parlor room of his house. And so the, some will say that the war started in this guy's backyard and ended in his parlor room, he, um, which is interesting. I think the house still stands. I think it's like a, a museum. We'd have to look it up on, online. But he's a really wealthy guy. All right. Are we good to go? Okay, so the first bit of notes, the first bit of notes that I want to talk about is border states. This is not on the timeline, but I want to talk about the border border states. border states. These border states were, make sure you know these, Maryland, Kentucky, uh, Missouri, and Delaware. Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, and Delaware. Says, I hope to have God on our side in this war, but I must have Kentucky. Um, yeah. The states. It's Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware. Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware. Here, border, here are why these border states were so crucial. Had these, just these four border states seceded and joined the Confederate States of America. The Confederacy would have increased their total population, their total white male population, 50%. They would have added 50 more percent population, which was one of the major reasons, if not the biggest reason, why the South lost the war. They just ran out of, flat out ran out of manpower. And there's, other, there's other factors as well, but it's a big one. If these four border states would have joined the Confederacy, it would have increased their manufacturing capacity by 200%. If these four border states would have joined the Confederacy, their manufacturing capabilities would have increased 200%. And there would have also been more supplies like horses, mules, things like that, which are really crucial to war. We don't talk enough about uh, the, the importance of, of horses and, and animals in, in wars. Um, not to mention there would have been more railroads, there would have been more transportation and supply lines. The Ohio River is going to form the northern border of Kentucky, which is a, which is a big deal. Um, Lincoln said he had to have these border states. Had to. And part of the reason why you read Lincoln's words and his messages that he writes and, and speeches he gives they're worded very carefully as to not offend those border regions. He does not want to push them to the Confederate side. Yeah? Uh, what time does West Virginia split from Virginia? Good question. 1861 is when West Virginia splits from Virginia. And it, it was a part that wanted to stay with the Union. Virginia itself seceded. And we're going to talk about when all that stuff happens in, in the timeline as well. Um, In places where Lincoln was most worried, like Maryland, he actually, yep, uh, he actually um, sent in troops to Maryland and declared martial law in which, like, he suspended Maryland's laws and implemented federal laws. He actually had troops that were overseeing elections in Maryland. Um, I mean, Lincoln, he... In, in places like Maryland and parts of Maryland, he suspended newspapers that were pro-Southern newspapers, wouldn't let them print their newspapers there. I mean, like limiting free speech, basic rights, because he could not have a state 
that bordered the nation's capital joining the Confederacy. He just couldn't do it. He couldn't have it happen. And so it's one of the few things that's not talked about. We like to think of Lincoln as this very, like he's a lawyer, follows the law. He expanded executive power and infringed on some, definitely did some unconstitutional things. Um, make, sure you, make sure you have down, we did the advantages and disadvantages of the North and South the other day. Okay. Make talk about in an essay is that one other advantage of the South that they had, and you don't have to write this down, but make a mental note, is I said that the South had better leadership, military leadership, the fact that their generals had gotten experience during the Mexican-American War. The South also had a big advantage in the fact that citizens of the South, their lifestyle catered and translated to war much better than the North. If you're in the South, you grow up riding horses. You grow up shooting guns. You grow up learning how to navigate and rough it in the wilderness. Much more so than many northerners that are living in urban centers where you're not riding horses growing up from a young age. You might not be shooting guns from a young age. And so southerners, not only were their military uh, leaders more, better trained and, and better soldiers, but they also, their, their soldiers in general and their infantrymen were, were more... Uh, well, yeah, more skilled when it came to fighting and tactics like that. Um, one other thing. Actually, yeah, one other thing. Is opportunities for women. So, new opportunities for women in the Civil War. And if you have questions at any point in time, ask. Fourth Hour did a really good job of asking questions today. We cleared up a lot of stuff. So one of the newest opportunities for women is going to be new job opportunities. As men are going to serve in the war as soldiers, women are going to be taking more jobs, both in factories and even like federal government jobs. Um, before the war, about one in four manufacturing jobs were held by women, women working in textile factories and things like that. Uh, during the war, that's going to increase, one in every three Manufacturing jobs will be held by women. Ladies, you also are going to um, be serving as nurses for the armies. That, is, that was considered, um, after the Civil War, a very well-respected well profession. Uh, with the amount of violence and bloodshed during the Civil War, nurses and, and skilled nurses were doing were highly covered. And so it's turned into um, a profession that women are going to dominate and, and, and have played a role. Also, roles, organizational roles for women. Um, I talk about this, and I mean like things like fundraising. Putting on fundraising. Donation, supplies, money, things like that. Yeah. Both. Women in both sides. Women in the South are definitely going to, to be um, taking on new roles. Yeah. Was the... Um, actually, no. You good? Yeah. Okay. Um, two of the more famous women during the Civil War, Clara Barton, you may have heard of her. Um, Dorothea Dix is another lady that's in your, in your chapter that you should at least know something about. But those would be examples that you could throw in in an essay that would be really good evidence. Okay? Um, and then the last, the very, very last thing that I want you to know is that after the war, um, the economic outlook for the North and South were very different. So post-war, this is the last one, post-war, the South well, let's say post-war economies. The South is in shambles. Physically, physically, railroads are going to be torn up, destroyed. Cities are going to just be decimated in places in the South. Um, their whole financial system is in ruins. The South just got into the the groove of printing money, printing and printing and printing and printing and printing money. Inflation was out of control. Um, when the South started printing money at the beginning of the Civil War, they were called graybacks, their dollars were. Um, by the end of the war, 
what was worth a dollar, uh, you know, what was a, a note worth a dollar was worth three cents by the end of the war. That becomes very problematic. You can see how that's, that's a big deal. Um, and so the South leaves the war still with not a lot of manufacturing. They've lost ground as far as their infrastructure, like railroads, and their financial system is terrible. In the North, however, although there are some economic problems from a financial standpoint, the North is not so bad. I'm trying to use letter, the same letter so you can remember. Not so bad. Um, there was, we increasing our manufact, I say our, the North continued increasing its manufacturing during the war and continued and left and exited the Civil War from an economic standpoint of factories, the number of factories hit the ground running. And so in the years following the Civil War, you're going to see um, the division that's still there. Questions on that? All right, I'm moving on. So the uh, event is going to be Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter has April of 1861, the first, first shots are fired of the Revolutionary War. Sumter's in April of 1861. The things I would want you to know about this, militarily, it's a win for the South. They get the fort that they're trying to take over. Um, has anyone ever been to Fort Sumter, by the way? It's in South Carolina. It's in, has anyone been to Charleston? Got to go to Charleston. You've been through it? Yeah. Got to go to Charleston. Really, really cool city. You guys would really like it. Trust me. Go to Charleston if you ever get the opportunity to. There's a lot to do. It's got that old feel, old cobble, uh, stone streets, and, and you got to go see South Carolina, and, and it's beautiful there in Charleston. It's right on the water. But so Fort, Fort Sumter sits, sits just off the coast of Charleston. It's right at the mouth where, where ships would sail in from the Atlantic Ocean and deliver stuff. It was a federal fort, meaning it was a federal government fort. When, the South, when South Carolina seceded, they stopped allowing supplies to be sent to this fort. And so the, the fort itself and the Union soldiers that were stationed there, the federal soldiers stationed there, were running out of food, clothing, that kind of stuff. And so Lincoln knew that if he sent ships with soldiers or with guns, that the South would see it as an act of war, and they would claim that the North was provoking war on the South, even though the South had seceded. Keep in mind, when the South secedes, they're not, they're not declaring war on the North. They're just saying, we're out of here. It's the North's job to bring them back into the Union. Just like during the Revolutionary War, we declared independence. It was up to Great Britain to not allow us to do that. Think about it as like you guys walking out of your parents' house and saying, I'm going to live on my own. Like, your parents would have to physically stop you from doing that if they wanted you to, you know, come back and live in the house. Um, what are you laughing at? I don't know. They probably want me out of the way. Oh. So. Don't do it. I, I tried to run away once. It was a terrible idea. I was six, though. It wasn't good. Oh, I was like 16, so. Mine well, didn't work out well. No, it was like a legit, like, I'm moving out. And I slept under a tree one night, and oh yeah, and, like, and then I went back, and I got grounded for like months. <laughs> Bold strategy. Didn't work out well for me. Yeah. Oh, it was bad. It was bad. So anyways, um, so here's what happens, though. So it's a military victory for the South. They, they just start uh, shooting cannons. They're just, they're just um, bombarding this fort. No one actually dies. For, none of the federal... Fort die. But what happens is Lincoln, he sent in supplies, no guns or anything, just he wanted to resupply the fort, and they took this as an act of aggression. Lincoln knew this was going to happen. And so what he did is he made sure that every newspaper that he could in the north printed headlines that say what? South Carolina, South Carolina attacks fort. Bombs fort. And so it's used in the north to rally support in the north for the war. It was a tactical um, victory for, well, militarily it was a victory for the south, but as far as like who it helped overall, it was a more of a bigger positive for the north. Um, 
anytime you are attacked, your citizens will rally around those events. You think of any attacks that happen, even in recent times. Think about the, the Boston Marathon bombing. People, like, they rally around those types of events. If you ever want to see a really moving video, type in um, Boston Bruins National Anthem after the Boston Marathon bombing. The very next game that was played, the Boston Bruins uh, hockey team, they did a national anthem, and they did like this ceremony thing, the ceremonial tribute to the people who were hurt and injured, and then they did the national anthem. It is like stirring how you can't watch it and not have your heart beat a little faster and, and, and be moved by it. And so, I mean, we could talk about 9-11, right? 9-11 were attacked. The entire country rallies. In fact, George, George W. Bush had the highest approval rating ever recorded after 9-11 because people are so willing to rally. And so Lincoln knew this. Uh, because when you are the attacker, that lends to division. People always question, what, should we be attacking? Is this bad? Is this good? And Lincoln knew that, and so Fort Sumter was used to gain support. Yeah? Did this help um, with the border states? Uh, yes, in some ways it did help with the border states, although there's other things that are going to be more important to the border states, like the fact that Lincoln is going to allow them to keep slaves and, and never tries to emancipate slaves in the border states. Yeah? So it's kind of like um, the Alamo and Goliad? Yeah, it's exactly like the Alamo leading up to the Mexican-American War. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one other thing, just to make sure, you know in 1860 is when Lincoln's... <laughs> Hi. Hi! What are you doing here? Like a serious lesson. Oh, yeah, like super legit. Um, are you, are you going to be here for a while? Yeah. All right, let me torture them for a little bit longer and I'll come say hi. She lives in Italy. I mean, that's like a big deal. Um, this is when it's elected. Um, just so you know, between the end, so this is December of 1860 and February of 1861 is when those seven states secede. There's seven states that secede. I, I kind of want you to know it's... Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and leave. And then once Fort Sumter happens, right, and then we really see the war uh, ramping up, we get from April to June, between this time period, from April to June, we have Virginia... Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina are going to join. Uh, there's, a, there's a way to remember this. Seven originally secede. There's going to be a total of 11 states that will join the Confederacy. Just think 7-11. Okay? It's just the way to do it. Yeah, Danny. Didn't those states that left after Fort Sumter, didn't they leave because Lincoln called for troops to put down the rebellion? Yeah, so what happens is these states secede. Right? Lincoln sends a ship to resupply Fort Sumter. The battle happens. Lincoln uses the newspaper headlines to rally support and immediately calls for more troops. He expands the army. He says, we are going to start taking recruits. You want to enlist? Come enlist. And when this happens and the enlistment of more soldiers and the expanding of the army, it causes them to, to secede as well. It's like ramping up tensions. And it all leads to... It all leads to the first battle, which is going to happen in July. So this is July, July of 1860. <clears throat> July of 1861 is going to be the first battle of Bull Run. First Bull Run. Uh, if there was ever a time I could transport back into history and watch something happen, this would be one of those events. People were under the assumption. Hold on one second. I'll get your question. People were under the assumption that this was going to be the, like basically the one and only major battle of the Civil War. The thought was, the people in the North thought, we're going to win this battle, we're going to storm to Richmond, take the capital, war over. People in the th South thought, we're going to win this battle, the North's going to see that they don't really want to fight this war against us, and they're going to lose their will to continue fighting us. And so what happens is, as Union and Confederate troops converge, People start following troops to the, like, they want to see this go down. Like, people are carrying, like, picnic baskets. Like, you know, let's go watch the, the Battle of the Civil War. Like, they thought it was 
going to be a one and done type thing. Uh, the problem was is it like got chaotic really, really quickly. And so you have like soldiers and people watching from like a close distance away and then chaos breaks loose and reinforcements from the south come. By the way, these reinforcements from the south are led by a general named... Stonewall. No, Stonewall Jackson. That's where he gets his nickname at the Battle of Bull Run, Stonewall Jackson. Um, and people start, bullets are starting to whiz a little people for comfort and it chaos breaks out union troops just flee the battlefield and there's only like a little bridge to get over the the river there and so people are getting trampled i think actually someone or a couple people died because they were trampled in the whole chaos of the the fighting um like i don't know at what point it would seem like a good idea to go watch a war like i don't i don't know i can't i get yeah yeah i guess so i don't know i don't know um and so and so this is the first battle of Bull Run. The first battle of Bull Run is a Confederate victory. It is a Confederate victory. Big time. Confederate victory. The Union troops retreat. Although it's a Confederate victory, and I think this is interesting, most historians think this was the worst thing that could have happened to the South. And here's why. Southern confidence was super inflated after this victory. Uh, the number of enlistments, people enlisting in the Confederate Army, fell off following this because they thought the, the war was going to end and that the North was going to lose its will to win. Also, if the, if the South would have lost this war and had the Union troops stormed towards Richmond, taken the South's capital, and ended the war, slavery probably would have not been abolished. Let me say that again. Had the North won this war quickly and ended this in a matter of weeks more than likely the South could have negotiated some type of peace that would not have abolished slavery right away. Remember in Lincoln's first inaugural address here in, in March of 1861, he says, quote, I have no intention, no intention of doing anything with slavery where it currently exists. I do not have any intention of abolishing slavery where it exists. It's not until 1863, way over here, when he gives the pro uh, Emancipation Proclamation that he makes the war about slavery. And so it seems ironic, but had the South lost quickly, they may not have lost slavery, um, which they wound up, which slavery wound up being abolished well, politically and legally by the 13th Amendment later on. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right? The more longer it drags out, the, the harsher the repercussions are going to be. Yeah, it's a yeah, right? You hold out, you end up sleeping under a tree. It doesn't go well. Like, the longer I was gone, the, the, the more my, uh, my, uh, my punishment increased. So that, that happens in July, right? Uh, so there's not another major battle for the rest of 1861. You tend not to fight big battles or launch big campaigns, military campaigns, in the winter. Okay? Ask Napoleon how that works out. Ask Hitler how that works out. Uh, you don't want to launch big military campaigns in the heart of the winter. You don't want to lose troops to sickness. And, I mean, you want to talk about how to lower morale among your troops, make them camp out in a field during the winter months. It's awful. And so what you get is you get a, you get a cool down in, this, in the winter of 1861, right? More organization. You supply your troops. You figure out what your strategy is going to be. 1862 is when the North launches its first offensive, major offensive, and this is the Peninsula Campaign. Peninsula Campaign. And the Peninsula Campaign is going to go, I don't know, it lasts for throughout the spring of 1862. This is another blunder for the North. It is a Southern victory, Confederate victory. Um, the generals, you should know, there's two generals whose names you got to know. The North is McClellan, his nickname's Little Mac, M-C, Big C, E-L-L-A-N, McClellan. And the South is General Robert E. Lee. Lee kicks McClellan's butt. Uh, McClellan, if there's a fault of him as a general, it's that he cares too much about his troops. He never wants to sacrifice his men or put them in a situation where they're outnumbered or in a situation where they might be outmaneuvered. Uh, but the, 
the reality is when you go to war, sometimes you can't have conditions be perfect. Almost never will conditions be perfect for you to attack. His troops loved him because he didn't want to put them in harm's way. Abraham Lincoln hated him because he never wanted, he was never aggressive enough. If you eat something, if you eat something uh, bad and your stomach's upset, you have the runs. Yeah, do you know this? Lincoln used to say that, Lincoln used to say McClellan had the slows because he would never, he was never uh, aggressive enough for him. And he struggles finding a general to replace McClellan that is sufficient. Yeah. I read a book um, about like, influencing people. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's a letter written to McClellan. From Lincoln. Yeah, from Lincoln saying like, like basically ripping him. Oh, no, it does. R- Lincoln at one point, r- he's so frustrated with McClellan. I mean, they're like barely creeping along into the South. This happens in Virginia, by the way. This is in Virginia. Uh, Lincoln finally writes McClellan and says, excuse me, if, if you're not using the army, do you mind if I borrow it? <laughs> so he's like very frustrated with the fact that, and, but then McClellan finally works his way to where he's on the outskirts of Richmond, and then he just gets, he just gets slaughtered by Lee's troops in what's called the Seven Days Battle. Um, and they the Union Army all the way back to the coast. They abandon the campaign, and it's a big failure. And Lincoln yanks him, straight yanks McClellan from the general command and puts another guy in place. So that is the Peninsula Campaign. Um, the next one that you need to know, in August, which second battle of Bull Run, happens almost at the exact same place. So you got, this is this and I say that because you need to know that the fighting early on is in the Confederate territory, the South's territory, right? Second Battle of Bull Run is another Confederate victory. Lee rolls again. Do you see the see the trend that's going on here? Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about this. But keep in mind, we're, we're very early on into the war at this point. And, I, and there's lots of other battles. There's fighting going on in the West. And, in fact, like, there's fighting as far West and South as, like, New Mexico, I think, during the Civil War. We never talk about that, but Native Americans are going to be involved in this. Your book does a decent job talking about the Native Americans and their involvement if you go back and look through it. So, Second Battle of Bull Run is another Confederate victory. Um... And the result of this, the reason why I think this is important, Lee has now won, boom, 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 three in a row. And it causes him to go on the offensive. He is, he is, his thinking is, we've had success, they're on the run, and he finally goes and attacks into Maryland. He's going to send his major army into Maryland and attack now. Maryland is a border state that stayed loyal to the Union, and so now he's attacking into enemy territory. And this leads to one of the, the bloodiest day of the war, which happens at the Battle of Antietam. Antietam. And, you know, had that gone better, this is a turning point, a turning point in the war, a crucial point in the war. Had the South won this battle, very, very likely Great Britain or France would have gotten involved and, uh, and started supporting openly the South's cause. The North, Antietam winds up being a stalemate essentially, but Lee retreats back into Virginia, and so it's seen as a Southern loss because he retreats. By the way, 20,000 people hours in, in this battle, or there's 22,000 casualties, I should say. Uh, and this is one of those things where I think, what time do we get out today? Anyone know? I just, I'll tell you a story. Major events in U.S. history. Uh, today, no one knows how this happened or why this happened, but after Lee packed up shop and started marching his troops up northward, it was very common for the opposing armies to ride through with their, uh, just essentially try and find or gather intelligence or information or maybe even pick up some supplies that were left behind or whatever they could, scavenge the former camp of the opposing army. Does that make sense? And when they, when they 
Union, when the Union cavalry the, on their reconnaissance mission, uh, went into Lee's camp, they didn't find much of anything. And as they're about to leave, uh, a Union soldier sees a pack of cigars rolled in a piece of paper on the ground, which is like, you know, not a big deal, but hey, got some cigars to smoke on the way back, great. And unwraps the cigars, and no one to this day, no one knows how they got there. The piece of paper that the cigars were rolled in were Lee's entire battle plan strategy. It was like his entire strategy for what he was going to do in Maryland laid out on a piece of paper. Where he was going, what his intentions were, communications that were going to go out to uh, other generals. I mean, this is like the jackpot of what you could find. And they don't know why, it would, like, first of all, who would leave it, who it was supposed to, whose hands it was in, if Lee left it himself or if it was one of it, someone else. And so the North, this is a planned battle. The North knows he's going to be there. And so that's why it becomes such a bloody battle. It is, they know the entire Confederate army is going to be there and they try to surprise them with a huge, massive uh, Union army and it just is a bloodbath. Yeah. I, well, you just wanted to smoke it, I'm sure, is what I'm thinking. I, I don't know. I, I have no idea. But it's, your textbook does not play this up enough. I mean, this was like a turning point, like a momentous, uh, monumental event in the Civil War. And, I mean, it's just a stroke of luck. I mean, I got to assume. Uh, or an act of God. Uh, and so Antietam, right, is a planned battle. It is, at least from the North's perspective. They know he's going to be there, and they engage him in Antietam. Lee winds up retreating back to Virginia. Even though the North suffered more casualties than the South did, they retreat back into Virginia. Lincoln, and this is why this is a turning point, Lincoln, even though they don't necessarily rout the South, this is where Lincoln decides he's going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation the following January. So in January of 1863, this Antietam leads Lincoln Proclamation. He had been waiting for a good time in which the public might support him doing this. And so it goes into newspapers that the Union troops forced Lee to retreat, morale boosted. Uh, the British government, by the way, is backing off on the fact that ooh, the South just had their first major defeat and the Union troops were able to go toe to toe with them. And then, boom, January 1st, Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, writes it out, and, and Freed zero slaves. Zero. Did we talk about this? Yeah. Zero slaves freed. He said only slaves in the deep south that were rebelling were free. He didn't free any of the slaves in the border states. Um, and the southern plantation owners and slave owners, they weren't listening to a single word. Were there slaves that heard about this and maybe escaped north? Probably. But, I mean, there, this is not like he freed all of the slaves in one fell swoop. But what did happen is... To foreign countries abroad, this made the war now about a moral cause, slavery versus not slavery. And so it prevented foreign intervention. There were also people, by the way, in the North that were furious about the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, our country's worst riots in our entire history, the worst riots that have ever broken out in our country's history, the most violent riots ever, were in New York City, after the Emancipation Proclamation because they didn't want to fight a war to emancipate slaves. That was not what they were about. And so when uh, there was, when a draft was issued, so they were drafting people from New York to serve in the Union Army, they rioted. I mean, it was like days of violence, bloodshed, and arrest. That yeah. Part of Gangs of New York, right? Like, that was part of the I know, I haven't seen Gangs of New York. I know it's terrible for me to say that. It's with Leonardo DiCaprio. It could be. I, it very, very well could be. Uh, double check on it and let me know. And if there's a clip from it that you think, I know it's rated R, but if there's a clip we might be able to watch, it might be worth our while. We've watched a handful of R rated movies. Yeah, I know you have. Um, but so anyways, the Emancipation Proclamation, it, it, it caused tension. It, it really genuinely caused tension in the North. Think about this. The people who were the very, 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 very supportive of um, the abolitionist cause, people that hated slavery the most, they thought this was the fluffiest freaking thing they had ever read. It, they knew it didn't free anyone. 
Didn't free any of the slaves. They were pissed about it. People in regions like New York and other places like Ohio and Illinois where you had some people that were not abolitionists whatsoever, they thought this was terrible because they thought Lincoln was making the war about something they didn't want to fight for. And so this caused a lot of internal tension, but abroad it helped keep or stave off the involvement of foreign countries on, on behalf of the South. Any question on that at all? Yeah. Yeah, the British ruling class, the, the wealthy ruling elites of Great Britain, they were very sympathetic to the South. The more common average person was more sympathetic to the Norse cause. And, uh, and so you had a divide there, and, this, and the ruling class was not willing to create instability and potentially tension at home to support uh, a war on slavery, essentially is what it was. Yeah, that's it's exactly it. Um, one other thing about the uh, a good word or clause or group of words to use is it foreshadowed, even though it didn't do anything, it foreshadowed the 13th Amendment. It foreshadowed the 13th Amendment, uh, which isn't going to happen until 1865 is when the 13th Amendment is going to be ratified by the states, but it foreshadows the 13th Amendment. So it, it gave hope it freed no one, it kept foreign countries out of the war, and it foreshadowed the, the 13th Amendment. I, I'm assuming we get out pretty soon, yeah? yeah. No, we'll stop here. You guys did really well today. We'll be done. Wait, did you say it gave yeah, let's watch the games. Yeah. Well, it, it gave, gave abolitionists and slaves hope.